Um, today we're here for our very last master class of the 2023, and we are very lucky to have a return speaker, Dr. Shin, and, and most people just call him Shin, but I'll call him Dr. Shin because you know I respect him as a professor. Um, and he is going to discuss sort of what's going on in the, in the supply chain movement, um, post globalization, and also post. I think a lot of it has to do with COVID. Am I right? Um, Part of it, yes, <laughs> to some extent. Um, so we welcome you. Thank you for taking your time and, and spending, you know, again your lunch hour with us. Um, my name is Christina Cook. And I am um, the Associate Director of Graduate Admissions, and I deal primarily with the admissions for the Executive MBA program. Um, but moving on, um, before we get started, I'd like to briefly explain what these master classes are for. And essentially, they're an opportunity for interested candidates and, and you know, students um, to get a chance to have a have a you know an interactive conversation and experience with one of our faculty members here at Rady. Um, Without this, it'd be very difficult to see the uh, expertise we have on staff and to be able to fully take in what sort of education you're in store for should you come to Rady. Um, this will last approximately 45 minutes. Um, sometimes it goes a little bit over. If you need to go, I completely understand. And we do like these to be um, somewhat engaging and, and sort of hands-on. So be prepared for questions. Feel free to ask any at any time. Um, you can wait until the end when we have a question and answer um, section, or you can submit them in the chat and we'll do, our, we'll do our best to answer them as we go. As I mentioned before, my name is Christina Cook. I've probably seen you or you've heard from me at some point in your um, experience here at Rady. If not, I'll, I'll find you. Um, and my colleague, Sophia Palomino, she, here, she is here too. Unfortunately, she is, does not have a voice. There's something going around, and so she will be... Um, in the background, she is my counterpart and she manages sort of the um, admissions um, component for the Flex Evening Program. And we also have Audrey Phillips, who, uh, who is also not feeling so great today. Um, there's obviously something going around, but um, she is the director of MBA admissions for all of us and she is here joining us. So that's who we are. If you already know you wanna to talk to us, please write down our phone number or our email and reach out. Um, we would love to chat with you or set up a meeting to explain more about our program. So briefly, before we get into the, the main guest, um, I want to talk a little bit about what Rady is and why we're different. Um, I think the first and foremost um, differentiating factor is that we're a STEM designated MBA. And um, you know, if you don't already know, STEM designation typically implies that um, we are heavy in science, technology, engineering, and math, but not unlike UCSD as a university itself. Um, in fact, um, we are so similar in that respect in how we teach and what we, what we ask our students to do that all of our graduate programs here at Rady are STEM designated. And it was relatively easy to acquire that designation because it's, it is pretty much how we've always taught, um, which again goes back to our differentiating factor. We, did, we don't swing with the, the political movement of the day. We actually stick with who we really are and what we do well. Um, again, I mentioned a little bit about data. You will, if you come to Rady, you will you will have a very solid set of analytical skills and you'll realize that data can be used in every functional area of business to make decisions and to better strategically plan um, activities and actions. Um, we also believe that um, collaboration is key to really finding and determining the best answer for a solution. We, it, we, we want our students to be engaged. We want them to have different backgrounds and we, we really believe that different minds in the same room will definitely turn out um, produce a better outcome in the end. Um, and then also, you know, if you don't know, we talk about it a little bit, but we're very, very proud to be to have been ranked number four in learning by Bloomberg Business Week poll this, this last year, as well as fourth in entrepreneurship. And you're going to find out a little bit why we're four, we're number four in learning. That is primarily because of our amazing professors. And here we have our speaker. <laughs> I thought I'd just highlight you twice, Dr. Shin. Um, so we have amazing faculty. Um, in fact, what I like to say is, you know, we have a very young, let's say our faculty is generally younger than some other programs, which means they're still really interested in doing research and they're still interested in a lot of things that they can bring in the classroom. They're energetic and nimble and they are primarily responsible why we have that number four ranking in learning. Um, I'd also like to point out that, and you will find out throughout this presentation that we have very engaging faculty and they do care about students. Not only are they 
um, you know, sometimes world renowned in their research and what they bring to the university as a whole, but they're also very, very good instructors. And you will find that out today and also if you join our program. But more importantly, I think it's important to note that you've all known this at some point, I'm sure, that you can go to any place and you may have a really good instructor, but they may not be, you know, they may not be a full professor, they may, may not be bringing in research, but they're great instructors. And then you can go to some places that have, you know, highly acclaimed researchers that, you know, have, uh, you know, incredible work that's being, you know, cited all across the world, but they're not so great in the classroom. And I think, you know, when you come to a UC school, and particularly one in a very sunny, desirable location that has a huge draw of people to pull from in terms of hiring faculty, you're going to find out that our faculty are both, and they truly care about what you're learning and their learning outcomes. Um, I'm going to talk briefly just about the format of our three programs. We have the Flex Evening MBA, the Flex Weekend MBA, which is our executive cohort, and the full time. All three programs um, require 92 credit unions. They are, we are a quarter-based program. The evening program meets twice a week. And um, if you keep up that, it's twice a week, two classes a quarter. And if you keep up that pace, you're out in about 10 quarters or two and a half years. Um, the core traditionally meets, which is the core curriculum, which is what, what you take your first year, traditionally meets Tuesday, Thursday from 6.30 to 9.30. The Flex Weekend or Executives, same number of credits, same requirements, same classes, but it meets on the weekend every other weekend. So it's Saturday and Sunday, basically full days, um, but lunch breaks and things like that. And then you come back two weeks later. Um, it, it is a little bit faster paced. So it's three classes a quarter. And if you keep up that pace, you're out in two years flat. With both of those programs, however, you can accelerate it should you want to. You just need to take more classes in that second year of the program. And then the, the full-time MBA is what you consider, what, what most people think of off, offhand when they think of an MBA. You quit your job, you go to school, it's super intense. You do a summer internship, you come back and do the same thing, and you're done. And you go to school all day long, you know, kind of Monday through Thursday. <laughs> but the one, does, one um, another, another unifying factor is that once you're done with the core curriculum and all of these programs, you're welcome to take electives at any particular time. So if you are you started in the weekend program or the executive cohort, but there was a class you wanted to take on a Wednesday night, we want you to take it. And in fact, the more um, flexibility you have in a schedule, the better it really is. So you can take, you know, a specific class when you want it versus waiting when it, you know, waiting for when it shows up in your cycle of, of your program. But the idea there is not only to allow that flexibility, but to enable our students to interact with each other. And you, you, not only does that inspire more education and more information sharing, but it also grows your network. Um, checklist as to what we're looking for in an application. Hopefully all of you are thinking about that. We have an online application. It's a general online portal, very simple. We ask for transcripts of all your educational institutions to date, um, college and beyond. Um, we can use unofficial copies for our decision at the Rady College, but should you, should you be admitted and decide to come, the graduate division of UCSD will want those officials. We ask for a resume or a CV. Um, these recommendations, and these are actually not free form letters that people submit, but it's a recommendation that um, is provided to them, to, to your recommender, and we ask direct questions about you. So they don't have to come up with anything from scratch. We do have additional essays that we ask, no surprise there. Um, our GMAT and GRE scores, these are optional for all three of our programs. Um, you can submit it if you'd like, it is not required. And then finally, if you did attend a school in a, in a country, the language of instruction was not English, um, there's a specific list of schools that, that, you know, can, that are exemptions to this, but for the most part, if, if you follow that cloud category, we, we do need an English language test. And then finally, the application fee. But with that said, everyone who attended today will have an application fee waiver applied to their account should they start an application. We're taking attendance now. And what happens is when you start your application, we see that you attended this event and we go ahead and waive it for you. Deadlines coming up. We're getting towards the end of the cycle. Full time, the last deadline is June 1st. That's just a little over a month away. And the flex deadlines, we have two. June 1st is one of them. And the final deadline is July 15th. Um, so if you're thinking about it, now's the time to get going. Please make an appointment with myself or Sophia and we will help you through that process. And finally, I am here, I want to introduce our amazing speaker, professor, guest, um, Dr. Shin, who goes by Shin, as I mentioned, he's a professor of innovation, technology, and operations. And you'll understand why he has so many titles 
because he has so many um, degrees in various areas, including a PhD from Stanford, an MS in statistics, um, and I'm not sure where, why I didn't write the university down there, I apologize. He has an MS in ma management engineering and a BS in industrial engineering. So he covers the entire gamut in terms of supply chain engineering and operations and you know OB behavior. So, um, and another fun little fact that I really wanted to share, actually I asked him to provide something. Um, he was originally from a tiny South Korean village, which is called the Shin village. So we had a quick discussion. He believes most of the majority of those people are related to him in some way, shape or fashion, similar to those that we find in our 23andMe accounts that we have no idea who they are, but somehow related. Um, about 50% of this village, um, which is composed of only about 200 people. It's in the Ching Song County. They all have this family name, as I mentioned. Um, the remaining half have had their wives' names, which is interesting. So it's either Shin or their wives' names. And I'm, right now, less than 100 people live there. It's, it's sort of de degeneration shift is going on. Um, but his father is still there. And he said, aside from the mountains and tigers surrounding their home, the only other notable landmark <laughs> was a dreary correctional facility, which we all know is basically prisons, um, that was famous for keeping South Korea's most dangerous and notable criminals all locked up. Uh, the village was small, everyone knew everybody, and you knew if someone was mad at someone, it got around quickly. What they used to say is, um, everyone knew when someone exchanged a crossword with another, and they also knew how many spoons you had in your kitchen drawer. So with that, um, I am going to turn over the, the mic and the screen to Dr. Shin. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm gonna stop my sharing. Great, you thank you, Christina. And welcome. thank you all uh, for joining this session. Let me first screen my share, uh, share my screen. And um, today I want to talk about one project actually that I have done uh, during COVID in 2020 um, spring quarter, as well as 2024 quarter. I have done this project about uh, post-globalization supply chain movement with my students, both in Rady School and I had a student from uh, a, here at UCSD called a GPS school, um, Global Policy and Strategy School. And, and uh, today's presentation is mostly the results from that uh, project. And also I borrowed some statistics and data from the presentation of um, a Dean of GPS. Um, with that, uh, let me start today's topic, which is about post-globalization. And uh, in order to talk about post-globalization, we have to first talk about globalization, right? So if you think about a, the way that the whole sort of a economy moved, um, starting from, I will say, around 1980s with the help of technology, as well as uh, trade policy um, advancements like uh, uh, WTOs, for example, the whole industry changed uh, and, and globalized the, the, uh, the, the world quite a bit, right? But then also right now we are at, uh, I will say starting from what we observed is starting from around even 2010, uh, 2010s, we see some backwards movement uh, starting not just globalization, which happens starting from 1980s, but even starting from 2010, there were some tensions in geopolitics as well as some movement about bringing things back either uh, in the US or maybe at least in the continent of North American continent, either Canada or Mexico, right? So, and then um, COVID happened. And uh, the way that we observed uh, talking with a lot of industry experts is that uh, COVID definitely accelerated uh, that trend, right? So uh, with looking at this globalization, let's first look at uh, some data, right? So first, if we look at the, uh, the percentage of world trade um, out of the GDP, as you can see here, that percentage is 1970s around only about 30%, right? 30% of the GDP is coming from the trade. Uh, now, if you see the whole trend, it has been increasing quite a bit, um, especially starting from around 1990s NAFTA, as well as WTO, and in particular in 2001, China joins WTO, that accelerated this globalization. And with that, the, the volume of trade uh, as a percentage of GDP has been increased quite a bit. Uh, one thing to note here is still it is, in particular in the trade uh, uh, area, 
still it's a debate that whether globalization is 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 sort of going back into deglobalization, right? At least in the data, it shows that we are still in the increasing trend. Um, however, though, what when we talk with the industry experts, what we have seen is a little bit uh, a different angle, which I will share it in today's presentation. Now, if we look at this globalization, then did it help? Right? Did it help? Well, again, if we look at uh, the share of population living in extreme poverty uh, by work by different regions in the world, uh, clearly, as you can see here, this red line here, uh, the share of population in extreme poverty, this basically the red line, you, you can think of that as China, right? China's percentage of extreme poverty was 60% in 90, 1990. Now, if you see here, it decreased quite a bit. Now it's even less than 10%, right? This, I will say the impact of globalization, China became the world manufacturing plant that helped China quite a bit, right? Another one that helped is also in, in South Asia. You can think of India, Vietnam, and, and also Thailand. Uh, those also helped quite a bit, right? Um, so here, in terms of the trend, what we see is, those countries that opened up, uh, you know, in the and at the ride of globalization, they benefited quite a bit, right? Um, now, this is the side uh, outside of U.S. What happened uh, in in during those globalization period in U.S. With that, let's look at this price changes, right? So this is a price change starting from 1997 all the way to 2007. And if you see here, one thing is mostly, first of all, I will say college and education, the universities, they did a fantastic job in terms of increasing prices. Sorry for you guys, for students, but college tuition fees and educations, uh, that price increased rapidly, right? And also medical industry, the price increased quite a bit. Uh, medi medical care, child care, the price increased a lot. Right. Uh, overall, I will say housing, also something related to services, right? Uh, all those education, medical service, food and beverages, transportation, those are service areas, price increased quite a bit. Now, if you think about the service areas, uh, that industry is the sector which could not benefit a lot from globalization, right? You cannot outsource those services to China, for example. However, if you see some other industries, let's say TVs, toys, right, even clothing, the price actually decreased quite a bit, right? So this is, I will say, part of the reason is the globalization, right? Moving things and manufacturing TVs instead of here in US, but in China or in East Asian countries, that definitely reduced the price quite a bit. So this, I will say, is the benefit of globalization that uh, we have been enjoying right here in US, right? Now with that though, recently you see this geopolitical pen, uh, tensions and trade wars, and on top of that, COVID accelerated everything. And in not only the Trump administration, Biden administration mostly kept the trade policies from the Trump administration too. So with that, there is some tension in this globalization, right? So with that, we started this project on post-globalization. And what we did was we focused on four specific countries. First one was US, second one was Mexico, and the third one was China, and the last one was, was India. And we wanted to see this impact on the supply chains. The globalization, Part, part of it was actually brought by this movement of the supply chain, moving all the manufacturing, sort of a, a, a low value manufacturing and assembly stuff to low labor, right? Uh, low labor cost regions. So we wanted to look at this globalization in the angle, through the angle of supply chains. Right? And now when we, <laughs> one thing interesting about COVID was uh, before COVID, 
uh, people ask me, hey, Shin, uh, what do you study? Uh, what do you do in your research? I say, well, my research area is supply chain and people roll their eyes and then move on, right? Uh, some people may venture into asking, what do you mean by supply chain, right? However, though, after COVID, I say uh, I study supply chain. First of all, the good thing is everyone knows supply chain, right? And all of a sudden, supply chain became a cool thing. So people ask, oh, that's a cool thing. So here, though, I will say again, what do I mean by supply chain, right? So we as a customer, we will buy some stuff from the retailer. And, and that retailer will get those stuff from the distributors. However, though, something has to be made, right, or manufactured. And, and not only it stops there, but uh, it doesn't stop there, but also in order to manufacture some stuff, we have to buy either um, raw materials or uh, the, the, you know, the parts, right? Just as one example, if you think about your clothes, right? Um, here is one interesting part. Um, mostly, I will say your clothes, the raw material is cottons, right? Raw materials of most um, uh, clothes will be cottons. And um, where do you think, which one do you think is, which country do you think is number one exporter in the world for cotton? Can you type it in your chat? Number one cotton exporting country. India, I see India. Christina, some said US. China, I see. And, and India. We, with that, let me say, tell you this. It, China and India still are, you know, a, a mass sort of a growers of cottons. But in terms of number one export country in the world, it is actually surprisingly US, right? Specifically, um, you know, Rubok, Texas is the region for cottons, right? So if you think about the whole sort of a supply chain of these clothes, first of all, cottons will be grown in Rubok, Texas. It will be then shipped all the way to China and then manufactured there, either China or Vietnam in, in Southeast Asian region. And then it will ship back to US to sell those clothes to the customers, right? That is the whole sort of the global supply chain. And, and that's what we are talking about here. And one thing also I want to mention, one related to even the environmental issues. Um, if you think about, um, all those, let's say, starting from the um, carbons, right? Um, previously, you know, in 1930s and 40s, it was actually cottons were grown here in Texas, and then it was also manufactured probably somewhere in Texas or in California and sold it here, right? Now, if you think about carbon emissions, in particular in transportations, it was, there were some, but not to this magnitude of moving every, you know, moving those cottons to, to China and then moving it back, sort of having two round trip across Pacific, that creates huge um, carbon emissions, right? So that one thing is you can say globalization is then actually creates a lot of um, carbon emissions, right? However, though, I will argue the other way as well. Um, if you think about, let's say um, milks, right? Um, indeed, there are some a, um, milk farms even in surprisingly Saudi Arabia, right? In Middle East. And in those milk farms in Middle East, what they do is, you know, first of all, milk farm itself is just too hot. So they will actually water all the cows several times a day to, to cool uh, the temperature. So in that sense, if you think about the carbon emissions, let's say there locally they produce those milks and then they provide milks to their population. In terms of transportation, it's smaller, but in terms of manufacturing itself, it actually requires a lot of carbon emissions for those waters and whatnot, right? So when we think about the carbon emissions in terms of environmental uh, impact, uh, sometimes it's not just transportation 
And it's not that simple in the way that globalization actually created more, more carbon emissions. For some industries, actually globalization reduced carbon emissions, just like that example of, um, of uh, milk production. Also, even solar panels, right? Uh, solar panels, again, majority of the solar panels are produced in, in China and some in India. And with that mass production, there is economies of scale. And with that economies of scale, not only price goes down, but also the impact in the environment can be less as well. So with that, let me then move on to what specific business categories that we looked at. There are three specific business categories. Uh, first one was the manufacturing site, another one was the services, and the last one was the products. And some characteristics will be, let's say for um, services, it is labor intensive. For manufacturers, it could be either capital intensive as well as labor intensive, right? Some manufacturers will be capital intensive, some will be labor intensive. Uh, let me get back to that um, solar panel production, right? Uh, if you think about the solar panel productions, uh, there is the, the whole supply chain of solar panel productions. First of all, you will have a, a silicon ingots. And from silicon ingots, you will get the cells. And you will then assemble those cells into solar panels. So roughly speaking, you can think of two production stages. The first one is making solar cells from ingots. And the second stage is assembling cells into panels. And now that second step, uh, assembling cells into panels, that is very capital intensive, right? So, so in that way, not much of a labor needed in terms of assembly cells, assembling cells to solar panels. Uh, rather, it is extremely automated and capital intensive. Relatively speaking, the first step though in the supply chain that uh, making cells from ingots, that's not as capital intensive as the second one. So even in manufacturing stage, there could be sort of a capital intensive ones and the labor intensive ones. And, and related to that, um, here is one interesting sort of anecdote that I have seen, uh, in particular in the solar panel industry. If you think about the solar panel industry, one reason why China dominated in that industry is because of the labor cost, of the cheap labor cost, right? The supply chain, um, one of my uh, close colleague, Tom Linton, who used to be the chief supply chain officer at Flextronics, now Flex, used to say supply chain is like a water, right? Water always moves from high place to the low place, meaning supply chain will always move. If there is a low cost, it will move from high cost to low cost. That is business, right? As simple as that. And with that though, if you think about that capital intensive process of assembling cells into solar panels, that's not much of a labor is needed. So in that sense, um, labor cost is not big of a concern. So if you think about that making, um, assembling cells into solar panels, which means that can be done pretty much anywhere as long as you have capital, right? So um, recently I was talking with this cross-border initiatives and in companies in, in Tijuana and Mexicali's and, and one of their sort of a, a um, suggestion was, hey, for that solar panel industry, given it's sort of a, a capital intensiveness, it could be done anywhere. In particular, given that Mexico is quite close to um, uh, US, it can be done here in Mexico instead of China. Now, the problem is, in order to assemble those cells into solar panels, you have to buy cells from someone, right? In this case, for all those cells, again, the suppliers of cells are mostly in China who also have the scale, right? So in that sense, you can actually build those solar panels either in US or in Mexico from cells, but then, you have to buy cells from those Chinese suppliers who are actually currently also assembling those cells into panels too. So, um, and, and the problem is when you buy those cells from the Chinese suppliers, the price is the big deal, right? If we have a new company assembling cells into panels in US or in Mexico, when they buy those cells from Chinese suppliers, the price goes up compared to the case in which those Chinese cell suppliers 
are producing or assembling cells into panels by themselves, right? So now that was one reason, one sort of a challenges that they had, but then guess what? Who's investing in those uh, areas in Mexico to assemble cells into panels? In terms of foreign direct investment in Mexico, what I hear is this, although uh, in the US also in, in Mexican economy, they try to, to allure lots of companies from here also in, in, in in um, Mexico for direct investment, one of the nations which actually invests a lot in Mexico happens to be China, right? Because Chinese companies, think about their, their incentives, right? Chinese companies who are actually producing all those cells, they already have plants in China and they, try, they know the market is in US. And because of those tensions, hey, there are some issues. Let's try to diversify. And anyway, those assembly line is automated. We can do anywhere. So let's build a plant in China, invest in Mexico, build a plant in Mexico. And then if they assemble those cells into panels and then sell it to, to US, not much of a loss for them uh, other, you know, compared to other companies. So that's one example of manufacturers. And um, the last is the, is the product, right? In terms of the product, the key is some products are very IP focused and others can be also labor intensive too, right? So now we will look at those three, uh, we looked at those three uh, business categories based on this framework that we came up with. Uh, actually, this project is a collaboration with uh, W Consulting at Helen Wang. Um, and, and she also um, sort of a, a, a tried to come up with this framework. We call that as 5D model, five dimensional model. And those five dimensional will be, uh, let's start from the bottom line. Bottom line, it's all about the cost, right? The labor cost and material cost. And that is one dimension, the bottom line. And the top line is the revenue side. Where are the consumers, right? So the consumer side of it will be the top line. And then the, another two dimension is soft power and hard power. Hard power is more on the infrastructure as well as trade policies. Right? Soft power is on the people side, which is on the talent side, for example. Right? And those are the four dimensions. And the last dimension is the time. And then on top of that, we did the benchmark and the SWOT analysis. And uh, let me try to illustrate this 5D model um, in particular related to globalization and this movement through China, right? If you think about 1980s and early 90s, the reason why many companies move their plants to China is mostly based on the bottom line. Search for the, the co uh, low cost labor leverage, right? So they moved on to China for the bottom line purposes. And China, in this case, actually responded quite well by building up and improving their hard power. Meaning, first of all, the trade policy helped. They also, um, in, uh, they also sort of a joint WTO. And also immediately they moved on to um, building a lot of uh, infrastructures, right? So they invested quite a bit on hard power, which helped them quite a bit. Now, as time goes by, if you ask many companies now why they still have their plans in China, they will not just say it's because of the bottom line or the hard power, right? They will say number one, top line, right? Top line being, hey, the reason why we, we, we don't want to necessarily actually get out of China is because Chinese has, China has the market. Right. It has a substantially growing market. Right? So top line matters. And the second one is the soft power. Right? One challenge is of moving things from China to, to US or Mexico is what they're saying is, hey, actually, even in terms of the talent of those scientists and the engineers, China has those talents. China built those talents for the past 20, 30 years U.S. lost that talent, right? We do not have the talent here now, right? Especially compared to China. So at this point, the reason why Chinese still kept majority of the manufacturing and, and for sure in the foreseeable future is changed from the bottom line and the hard power 
to top line and the soft power. So with that, what I will present to you is, first of all, I will quickly go over the SWOT analysis of those four countries, and then I will present the benchmark analysis that we have done, right? So let's go to the SWOT analysis first. Uh, first of the SWOT, which is the strength analysis, right? So this is based on the interviews of industry experts and uh, what those uh, industry experts said about the strength in, in China is in this pie chart, if you see the orange, that is the hard power. This is the uh, number of observations that those industry experts mentioned the strength in terms of China for each country, right? So that orange is the hard power and the gray is, is the soft power, right? And, and the green is a top line and the blue is the bottom line. In China's case, many industry experts mentioned that the strength is on the hard power side of it, which is government strategies of infrastructure, um, even in terms of strategies that one belt and one road strategy, as well as the big infrastructure, that was the major strength of China, right? In Mexico's case, it was that it was still on the hard power side of it, but not the infrastructure, but on the trade policy, right? Such as USMCA or um, government incentives like Maquiladoras, right? In India's case, the biggest part of it in terms of strength was actually uh, the bottom line, right? Which is the labor cost. And also, um, Unlike in China's case, uh, they also mentioned hard power, not on the infrastructure side of it, but IP protection side of it, right? In particular, compared to China, India is better equipped in terms of IP protection. Uh, had, in US's case, uh, the biggest will be, again, at the markets, uh, the top line. Many people mentioned that, especially this was bigger compared to other countries and also proximity to customers. So this is a strength part of it. Now let's move on to the W side, which is the weakness side, right? So the weakness side in China's case, the big one was a uh, top line, in particular uh, production quality, right? Many people said uh, still the quality is an issue, right? And interestingly enough, we will also see this in our benchmark analysis. Uh, many people said in terms of the weakness in China, the bottom line, which is increasing cost used to be really low, now not anymore. And in Mexico's case, the big part of it, they said, um, this was also interesting, the soft power side of it. Um, and many industry experts said, especially in Mexico, uh, people's preference, especially the relative preference for uh, work-life balance is um, to some extent not as good as other countries like China or India, right? Meaning, um, I guess the Mexico population, they put the life first than, than the work side of it. Uh, this was actually um, interesting um, observation. And in India's case, the biggest weakness was the infrastructure and the red tapes on the hard power side. Just too many red tapes and, and a very weak infrastructure. And in USA's case, definitely on the high cost side, that was the biggest uh, weakness, right? With that, let's move on to O, which is the opportunity side. For the opportunity side, first of all, overall in all the countries, ex industry experts said the number one customers, the top lines, the growing markets, right? Which applies to everywhere. And, um, and also in Mexico's case, they were saying the bottom line can be also another opportunity, the cost side of it. And also if the hard power side of the, the integration with the US market, which that can be improved, this can be an opportunity. And in India's case, again, the, the market, the top line, as well as uh, the opportunity side, many people mentioned a bottom line, right? Which is a low cost, right? Untapped low cost, they said that's another, um, opportunity for India and US's case definitely on the market. Right? Now then the last part, what is the threat? In terms of the threat, again, the overall theme for all countries, they said uh, the hard power side of it, which is basically geopolitical and trade tensions right? um, and the tariffs, right? 
And also increasing cost is another concern. Uh, those are the, the main concerns in China and India. And in Mexico's case, the threat was, another threat was this, uh, the threat from the automations. And given the, um, let's say Mexico's strong uh, opportunity on the labor side of it, if the, that automation can be a, a threatening factor for the long-term labor cost advantage. And with that, let me just quickly recap on the SWOT analysis. Uh, China, what we saw was uh, here, the green is the opportunity, the positive side of it. And the red is the threat, uh, which is the negative side of it. And the China was a, a all growing performer. The negative side was the trade tensions. And Mexico's opportunity was definitely the potential, trade potential with US. And, but the challenge is how to develop that capacity, right? India's case is the strength was that talent side of it, the technical talent side of it. But again, the downside is that uh, the ease of doing business was pretty low, as well as uh, surprisingly a poor, poor global trade connectivity. And, and with that, uh, this concludes the SWOT analysis. Let me move on to the benchmark. Uh, we did uh, quite a few benchmarks, but just as an example, I want to illustrate this specific one which is a uh, PCBA, right? Printed Circuit Board Assembly Industry. And we looked at um, this specific industry and compared the cost across those four um, regions and US being a, our benchmark number one. And surprisingly, what we have seen in this particular industry of um, printed circuit board assembly is that um, in China's case, uh, that blue part is just the cost of manufacturing and transportation. But if we add 25% tariff, which is already imposed, that completely wipes out the, the cost advantage of Chinese manufacturing, right? So that even in terms of, if we look at just the landed cost, China is not a, a low cost region anymore, right? Even at this point. That was to, to us a quite surprising, in particular because of that 25% um, tariff. India and Mexico still um, a low cost, um, but again, the quality may become an issue, right? And with that, let me move on to a benchmark key takeaways. Okay, uh, here we just look at the bottom line, the cost side of it. And um, in the top line side, uh, one thing that was interesting is if we look at a um, ease of business, right? Um, this is a spider plot. If you if it is pointed outside of it, that means it's a high score. Okay? If it is pointed towards inside of it, that means it's a low score. And blue is United States, green is Mexico, orange is India, red is China. So in the top line, if you look at the ease of business, surprisingly, China topped. Right? China actually topped in terms of ease of business. And if we look at the soft power, um, again, one thing interesting was IP protection. Um, as we expected, to some, uh, US was the top, other countries were lagging. Right? And in terms of hard power, this was also quite surprising um, in, in ESG compliance. Surprisingly, India actually uh, scored pretty well, right? So those are some benchmarking data. Um, and with that, let me move on to Q, uh, key future parameters. So what we looked at is in terms of manufacturing, we look at the trade policy and customer proximity and also supplier proximity. For services, the key impact that we have seen was digitization and the technology and product side of it, it is sourcing and trade. Right? To recap again, for services, the key sort of a factor that impacted our future productions, uh, future predictions were technology and, and digital transformation. And product and manufacturing side of it is the diversification and the clustering, but Still, many um, industry experts mentioning, nonetheless, we cannot um, ignore the cost in the end. Right? With that, um, what we have seen uh, in terms of already observed movement is in manufacturing. 
we don't see much of a movement coming back to Mexico or US, but what we see is rather a rebalancing, rebalancing from China to Southeast Asia, right? rebalancing from China to Vietnam, for example, or uh, what they call a China plus strategy. They still keep China, but sometimes they say China plus one, right? Plus one being China plus Vietnam or China plus Mexico, right? And Vietnam became a number one sort of a, a benefactor for this movement or the strategy change. And services, again, uh, US, you know, United States will most likely remain as a dominant player in this industry, but uh, the transformer will be the technology and the digitization. And products, it's a similar. The key is uh, the sourcing wise, though, that will be more diversified, right? So in China Plus strategy, uh, what we have seen is two countries, Vietnam and uh, Taiwan. Vietnam became a more general sort of a, a China's almost like a subsidiary and Taiwan's case more focusing on the high tech. And the impact here, the factor to consider is the trade policy and clustering as well as a bottom line, the cost, right? In particular, because China's cost increased quite a bit. And the key though is at this point, the capacity in Vietnam is pretty much maxed out. Lots of companies uh, move to build something in Vietnam, but there's just not much capacity left in Vietnam. So the question is then where else, right? Even if it's China plus one, Vietnam's great, but that's already fully occupied. Where should we go? What we identified is in terms of midterm contender, two countries, which is Mexico and India. And India, one reason, huge capacity, right? Uh, there are huge capacity and the opportunity left. So by that reason, India, we predict that at some point will become a contender, a big contender. Uh, uh, in terms of a, a you know, competition between China. And another one will be Mexico, which is a resilience perspective, right? And overall, what we see is more regional supply chains, meaning there might be Southeast supply chains around China, and there will be um, sort of a North, Northern American supply chains between US, Canada, and Mexico, right? With that, the key factors and the strategies to consider will be still number one, the bottom lines and the efficiency and the cost, but at the same time, the resilience and diversification will matter. Uh, that way, in particular, if you think about the impact of COVID, which accelerated this, um, this trend, the regionalization will be the key, right? With that, let me move on to my final slide. Uh, what we concluded, was um, still US will be a innovation leader now and also in the future. Um, this leaves me a one sort of a concern, right? Which is um, if you think about the whole movement that's happening now through the CHIPS Act and IRA, uh, basically what uh, the government is trying to do is trying to move a manufacturing in particular in semiconductors back into US which will create jobs and, and all good. The concern is that um, there is a reason why those manufacturings moved out of US. And it's not the case that everything moved out of US, right? The more of the high value um, segment of it, which is on the R&D and the design stayed in US, right? But then those less value added ones, in particular in the manufacturing side, that moved um, out, of China, out of US to China. And there was actually a recent Economist article about this, which is now, if we move back those um, low value added manufacturing ones back into the US, um, again, it, it might be good in terms of jobs and whatnot, but at the same time, in terms of the growth and value added, um, there might be some questions. And the next one um, in, in Mexico's case, the key is Mexico will be a, a opportunity and uh, developing a midstream manufacturing hub can be their strategy. And China's case, they will remain as a dominant global supplier and their manufacturing edge, their manufacturing um, competitive edge will sustain. 
And the last one, uh, the India, India will be a tremendous potential. Um, the only thing to be careful there is the uh, infrastructure and the red tapes. Okay. With that, I will end my um, presentation. If you have any questions, please. So this is the time when it gets to be interactive. <laughs> so if anyone wants to engage, we'd love to hear some questions. Um, we got some, some thanks in the chat, Dr. Shin. Great presentation. Thank you. Thank you all for um, joining. We also did pop, Sophia popped in a QR code. So if you have them have a moment, we'd love for you to scan it and just let us know your thoughts about the presentation and um, you know what we're doing here at Brady. That'd be very helpful. Um, um, gosh, I know we're a little over, so some folks may need to leave. I found this to be incredibly, uh, incredibly interesting discussion. And if someone's not going to ask a question, I will. Um, but then, you know, I just keep going. So this might be your chance. <laughs> Do you have any, have any questions you want to ask? Um, looks like some folks are leaving. So Dr. Chin, I do have a question. So please, I think that, you know, just on the surface, you know, not going really deep into things. A lot of people are thinking like, well, things are coming back to America because of protectionism. And it's really more of a response to America's dis distaste and other countries' dislike of our policies and our, you know, our government, as opposed to, okay, well, it's actually becoming a better economic you know, situation for us to be doing some of these things and to bring more of the manufacturing closer to America versus you know, what we did in the, in the 80s and 90s by you know, basically sending around the world. So, is that accurate that it really isn't a political situation? I mean, there is some, but in terms of why why some of this is moving back closer to the states and within the states, it really is just a matter of the bottom line and overall, just you know, you know, basic business decisions versus um, the idea that you know we really should be or have any anything to do with other countries, which you know, some some a lot of people really believe. Ooh, okay, great, great question, um, Christina. Um, in the end, well, actually, just just to increase more um, interaction, let me just stop sharing. Um, in the end, um, for business, it is what it is, um, in the sense that in the end, um, the money will drive, right? Uh, but um, one thing is is um, you know politics is different, but also government. Um, the one reason why some business will definitely move and, and come to uh, come to US or even in Mexico um, out of China is even in terms of the money, uh, government subsidy matters, right? In particular, not just a direct subsidy um, through CHIPS Act or IRA, but also a lot of tax credits, right? Um, that can sort of negatively impact other companies, right? Tax credits for, for um, let's say domestic companies, but also tax tariffs on the international yeah. companies that can definitely um, uh, help coming, uh, moving things back. But, um, you know, uh, but at the same time, I will also mention this, in terms of government's direct subsidy, Although if you look at the numbers of chip sector and IRAs, it's not just billions, it's close to you know, uh, like, like tens of hundreds of billions. It looks big, right? Uh, if you look at those chip sector and, and IRAs, but if you look at the details, um, chip sector, all the money there is not just for uh, uh, helping companies to build a plant, right? Lots of other things on, on let's say, um, uh, you know, childcare is there and, and all sorts of other things are there in that yeah, as well. Right. So if you look at just the uh, helping companies to build, uh, build plants here and, and invest, that money is not, is not too big, right? In particular, if it is only for the government money to build, um, I don't think it will help much. It, mm -hmm. it, it, for that to happen, it's got to be the case that the business, the private sector should move and then invest. Okay. Um, so having said that, um, another one though, not just the business side, but in the government side of it, um, is what they say is a lot on the emphasis on the security, right? national security. And once that comes, um, I don't know what to say. <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter. It's a national security issue, right? Um, uh, 
Um, uh, but just purely good. academically and economically speaking, trade helps. That's that's what you know textbooks say. That's what we see. We have seen. Um, but um, politics and national security is a different matter. Right. Well, isn't isn't imposing these tariffs and incentives? Isn't that just a different form of protection? I mean, it's basically it's incentives to come back to the United States for some reason, uh, you know, yes. so whether or not it's going to work because it may not have enough, you know, beef to it. Um, but it still isn't it still the same. I mean, we used to be giving incentives for people to do business elsewhere. I mean, there was NAFTA, et cetera. But now isn't it sort of the same thing? It's just very not may not be very effective. Well, it's incentives will work. Um, I, I know uh, one thing about incentives. Incentives are good because it works. But at the same time, incentives are bad because it works. <laughs> Right. Okay. right. So, um, so for for those incentives, I'm sure people will react to it, and it'll work. Um, but protection itself, um, um, that I, I honestly I don't know whether the protectionism is is good or not. Right. Um, if we can focus more on sort of a high value added ones, and and if we keep going like that, um, you know, I can see that's a great benefit of it. Um, but at the same time, you know. Yeah, got it. Exactly. We have another there question from the chat. Yeah, sorry, I dominated. But Bernie asked a question. He says, are there any projections for the BRIC countries effect on globalization? Which we actually ah, haven't great, heard about great, some of those countries that are in, in a while. Right, actually, great, great question. Great question, Bernie. So um, I, I didn't present here, uh, but what, you know, if you remember what I said in terms of Mexico and, and, and India, um, I said, uh, those are the midterm contenders, right? And then we had a long-term projections and long-term contenders. Though most of countries on the long-term contenders, we said from the BRICS, mm -hmm. right? In, in particular in uh, countries from the Latin America, um, those I think has the good big advantage of it is not only the cost side of it and whatnot, but also they have resources. They have natural resources, right? I mean, we haven't discussed much on the conflict minerals and, and those um, natural resources. But uh, one of the advantages of the Latin American countries is they do have those uh, natural resources. And that can be a um, great um, advantage, right? Uh, but though I will emphasize also infrastructure is an issue, right? Um, if you see actually um, uh, even the road, or not only mentioning the rail, but just the road, right? Um, if you see a road from Latin America, any countries from Latin America to US, actually there is one area in which there's no road, right? Uh, it's right around, you know, um, uh, the, uh, just, just right on the edge of Latin America and the, the, the mid America, the Panama region, there was one forest in which there's no role, right? So mm -hmm. if you want to move things from Latin America to US at this point, you know, either ocean or air freight's only option. So uh, definitely on the infrastructure side of it, uh, there's gotta be some work to be done. Well, we are at one o'clock, so I will stop asking questions. <laughs> um, if there's anyone in the audience that has a question, please, um, we'd love to hear it. If not, I want to thank you for coming today, spending your lunch with us and learning um, a whole lot from Dr. Shin today. Really thank you, Dr. Shin. That was, uh, as always, it's a very interesting um, discussion and, and your, your presentation and animation is so appreciated. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thank you very much. Okay, well, I'm going to sign off. Thanks, everyone, for showing up. Thanks for the questions. And again, if you have any questions, please contact Sophia or I. We are here to help. Bye.